guys, this is Dr. Brian Mann, University of Miami. Uh, if my voice sounds a little uh, hoarse, it's because it is. I uh, did the isometric mid dipole testing with the women's basketball team here yesterday, and verbal encouragement was definitely given, so uh, I'm dealing with repercussions of that today. So if I smell like, sound like I've been smoking three packs a day, uh, it's not because I have, it's because I was busted out the coaching pipes. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about a study, the velocity specificity of weight training for kayak uh, sprint performance. Uh, we can see the two authors here, and Hopkins of the uh, magnitude-based inference uh, is, uh, is one of those, and we'll get to that here in a second. Um, come on. Now, athletes often use weight training to prepare for sprint events, but the effectiveness of different types of weight training for sprinting is unclear. We have therefore investigated the, um, uh, the effect of slow and explosive weight training on kayak sprint performance. So they're, they've taken high level athletes and they're giving them different training methodologies to see how it affects the sprint performance in the sport. So this is pretty cool. We've got uh, multiple different interventions going on here. We're gonna see what's the most effective. So they had three, so they did uh, an explosive, a slow, and a control, and I believe we get that get to that on our um, subsequent slides here in just a second to show the differences between the groups. But uh, one of them, the control group, uh, is they didn't do any addition; they didn't train. The explosive group, they uh, had a tempo, and I believe it was like 0.8 meters per second, 0.87 uh, for the repetition. And then the uh, slow, it was like one point. 34, 1.7 seconds, somewhere around in there. So it was, uh, I believe it was done off of a metronome. But if we look at the sample, so we got both males and females in here. So we know that uh, how it'll work out for gender. Uh, the sample size by competitive level. Okay, so I think that this is you know, very, very telling that uh, the, they've got 29, 10, 9, 10, and 10 national level competitive athletes you can't get much higher than that if they're on the national team or they're they're competing at that national level dude i mean this we're talking about elite athletes so that's something that's pretty interesting here uh, we see their ages uh how long they've been doing kayak training uh and then uh well how many hours a week do they kayak train how many hours a week do they do other types of training yeah. Uh, what's the other training? Maybe it's strength training, maybe it's cardiovascular training, maybe, you know, whatever happens to be, they were controlling for that. Uh, we can see that the explosive group had a little bit of a difference there. Uh, their previous weight training percent, so how heavy were they going? Uh, then uh, the last regular weight sessions, how many, how long had they been training? So we see 25 months, 30 months, 26 months. And sometimes the standard deviation is almost the same as the mean, and that's just showing that we've got a wide range of athletes here. Uh, now, this might be a bit of a weakness because then we can't control for training experience. But that's okay because whenever we're dealing with athletes in sport, it gets a little dirty. Uh, I've had athletes who had, uh, coming in as a freshman, who had been training since they were 12. Now they're 18, so they had six years of training. I had athletes coming in who that was the first time they'd ever been inside of a weight room uh, at the college level across the various sports. So it's not uncommon to see huge variations like that. Now, they had a, a 15 meter sprint that was what their test was, and they broke it down into different phases. They had a zero to 3.75 meters and a 7.5 to 15 meters. Uh, for times that they compared. And we see that there's not a significant difference among them uh, for any of those metrics. We see what their bench press in kilos and their dumbbell pull was in kilos, what their 1RM was. And we see that, hey, man, there's not much of a difference there. Now, <clears throat> the weight training consisted of two sessions per week for six weeks. In each session, the athletes performed three to four sets of two sport-specific exercises with a load of 80% of 1RM. Now, here's how the training varied. And we see the 8.85 uh, 8 and the 1.7. So they were taking 1.7 seconds to do the concentric phase for the slow, 
and 0.85 seconds for the explosive. Now, we look here at the adaptations, and I think this is pretty cool. We're going to spend some time going through this. Now, this is, you know, if it's a Hopkins study, you know that it's going to be uh, MBI for the statistics. Now, one of the things to take into account with MBI is that it's been shown to overestimate, uh, you know, so, and that's okay, uh, in, in my opinion, and that's just my opinion. And whenever you're dealing with super small sample sizes, you lack the power to get significance many times. So looking at the effect size and looking at the magnitude of it, using that to see the difference. Now, whenever you have a small group, you've got to find a different way to do things. So is MBI necessarily the best way to do things based off of the, uh, the information that's come out? I don't know. I'm not going to get into that argument. I'm not going to get into that debate because, quite frankly, I've got to call people for my uh, anything beyond a, a simple ANOVA. Uh, I've got to call people on how to run it and, and making sure that what I think is the most appropriate is appropriate. Because that's just not my area. And I say that and I bring that up to be full disclosure that, hey, man, not everybody has to be good in everything. Uh, you typically, you see a team of authors. You usually don't see a single author. Uh, as uh, on a publication, that's because everybody's got their strong suit, right? Um, now, my personal opinion is whenever you're dealing with these elite groups, well, statistical significance isn't possible. Well, so let's say that I'm wanting to do a study on Division One athletes and the ACC and the sport of basketball in the city of Miami. Well, I think there's 12 guys on the University of Miami basketball team. And if my power analysis says that I need 30, well, I've got 12. I can't go get another 18. So we've got to look at different statistical methodologies. And I think that that's a strength of MBI. And what I think that MBI is telling us, and again, this is just me, is that, hey, this is something to look at in more detail. Or, you know, hey, you might be on to something here. Not oh this is the this is saying that this is the new uh, idol that everybody needs to be bowing down to as far as training goes. Okay. Let's that's just my personal opinion on that. But if we look at the overall speed, okay, and we look at the difference from slow to controlled, explosive control, and slow uh, to explosive, we see that there was a three point six percent improvement okay, for the slow and control a 2.5% for the explosive compared to the control, and a 1.1 for the slow compared to the explosive. So we see that, hey, explosive control was not as good as slow control. Slow is better than explosive. When we look over here, this is the percent chance of substantial improvement. So at 99.9 .9 and 99.5, these are both almost certain. So they both say that the slow and explosive are going to be better than doing nothing. And if we look at that wide variation of the training, we can see that, hey, you know what? Uh, I can see that because the training ages are pretty varied. And a beginner, they get just as much out of doing, you know, I, I often joke, you'll hear me uh, in classes or in lectures that hey, with the untrained population, all they got to do is look at the barbell and they get stronger, which is facetious, but it's, not too far off. Anything they do is going to cause improvement in the results. Now, <clears throat> whenever we start to look at the different phases, things start to tell a bit of a different story, and we'll get into why here shortly. Whenever we look at the slow versus control, and, and we're looking at the initial acceleration phase, so the 0 to 3.75 meters. Now, why is it important to break these two apart? Well, whenever you're at 0, you're at a dead stop. So being at a dead stop, you are going to have to overcome inertia, uh, and you're going to be having to move different speeds. Now, we look at the slow control, explosive control, or slow explosive. So the slow control, we see this 5.6 gain, so it's, it's huge, right? Explosive control, 1.8, slow explosive, 3.6. So we see that, hey, man, slow control is king in this one for this phase that we see, hey, almost certain it's 99.5 and uh, versus 69. So we see it's almost certain versus a possible improvement. And that to say that slow is better than explosive, in this, it's probable. Uh, so, hey man, let's, let's look there. We'll, we'll go over why here in just a second. The speed and maintenance phase. 
we see the slow control is 2.9. We see that the uh, explosive control is 3.8. And we see that the explosive to slow is 0.9. So we see the differences that exist here. And we see that the slow control is very likely to cause improvements in that speed maintenance phase. But the explosive control is almost certain to do that, as opposed to explosive slow. Now, that be, let's go over some things here, because I think that this is, uh, this is hugely important to understand, is that we deal with specificity. And so whenever I'm trying to overcome inertia, I'm trying to do the start of the sprint. Okay? Uh, if we think back about these things, let's look at sprinting or kayak. Both are going from a dead stop. We have been seeing time and time and time again that relative strength for sprinting is important for the first five to ten meters. Now, whenever we're doing a heavy squat in the squat 1RM, this is typically what they relate it back to, we know that the 1RM for it moves, for college athletes in my experience, moves somewhere between 0.35 for the freshman and down to somewhere between 0.25 and 0.3. Uh, for seniors in a sport like football. Now, <clears throat> we can see that, hey, that's definitely a slow movement, and we see that there's a, uh, an improvement there. Now, my guy, Bush X Nader, uh, who I, uh, is definitely an acquaintance of mine, I, I dare to call him a friend, uh, he has often said in presenting, and he was a sprints and jumps coach at LSU, that you squat for your 10 you clean for your 20, and beyond that is sprint mechanics. Well, it, it's looking to play true here as well. You are going to do heavy, slow movements to initially overcome inertia. And hey, man, whenever that ore hits the water, it's solid. So you can't really do much with it. You have to go slow, hard, pull with a great amount of Force, uh, low-end torque is a, a way that people would often talk about that. Whenever, the, uh, whenever you're already moving, well, the strengths at higher speeds are going to be more crucial because they're going to be more reflective of the activity that you're doing. So like in that 10 to 20, uh, for the sprint, as Boo had mentioned, for the clean. Well, the clean 1RM typically happens at about 1.44 meters per second peak velocity. Uh, in the sport of football, which is, and let's say mean velocity, uh, we're looking at 1.2 to 1.3. Now, we with that comparison, we see that, hey, man, the clean is moving faster than the squat, and the clean is better for the whenever you're moving, so that like that 10 to 20 period than the squat was. So, hey, let's look at, let's look at this here. You know, that if we, you know, what we need to work on is dependent on what we need to improve. So if somebody needs to improve their start, they should do slow control type training or heavy squatting type training. If they're needing beyond that for in this study, that seven and a half to 15 meters, it was that explosive control. And that has to do with the inertia and the speed at which that you can pull the ore uh, to be able to increase the speed there. And the ore might not be the appropriate term. I've looked at kayaks. I've been in one one time, uh, so I might have the terminology wrong there. And if I do, please forgive me, but hopefully you understand the point. So in the clean, if somebody has a great start and then they their acceleration isn't improving like you would think for that 10 to 20 period, well, that's whenever you would work on their clean or maybe a resisted sprint or something along those lines. But what happens if they uh, are great at the up to the 20 meters and then that, that 20 to 40 is where they, they lack? Well, maybe it's the resisted sled sprints. Maybe it's assisted sprinting. Maybe it's, you know, there, there's different things that you would do. So one of the things that we need to take into account also is the phase at which the movement is being done. Uh, I've seen some studies that simply talk about the squat in 40, and they didn't break it down. Well, most of the changes in the sprint time happened in the first 10 meters, uh, first 10 yards. Excuse me for that. So that's what, like 9.6 or 9.9 .9 meters, something like that. So what we're looking at here are the, uh, the differences in training and training specificity. 
If you need to improve a period that has just good speed, well, you're gonna be doing the more explosive lift. If you're needing to improve a portion that is slow speed, you're gonna look at that. So this specificity comes back into it, and that's all we're talking about here. Now, slow weight training, according to this study, is likely to be more effective than explosive training for improving the acceleration phase of sprinting. And, and, uh, and that's talking about the kayak. Uh, I don't really look at that as acceleration. Uh, I, I'm looking at it as starting speed, uh, and, and that's okay. Or it's a, well, actually really a, just a strength movement to overcome inertia. Now, the explosive weight training may be more effective in speed maintenance, or in my opinion, acceleration, uh, when forces are developed rapidly over a short period at the start of the stroke. So basically what we see is, hey, man, one is not better than the other. So that's, this study was not saying that at all. It was showing what is more likely to have an impact where. So if you want to work on a start, again, work on the heavy slow. If you want to work on acceleration or speed maintenance, as they called it here, uh, work on the faster loads. And remember, actually, faster means of performing the repetition. Because remember, they were using the same load. So the only thing that varied was the tempo at which they got. It. So this isn't just looking at... Uh, you know, low end torque, etc. It's looking at how the person performed the repetition. If it's slow, they saw better at the start. If it was fast, they would see more of an improvement uh, in the acceleration phase uh, uh, or speed maintenance phase, as they, they again they deemed it here. Now, what would happen then if we went with a heavier load on the slow training and the next a lighter load on the explosive? I think we might see the same results, uh, but see it in a little bit more uh, dichotomous form, that the heavier training would work even better at the start, and the lighter, faster training would work even better uh, in the acceleration phase. That's not what the study looked at, but that's just something to take into account, and it's something that uh, if you're thinking about for programming and thinking about for specificity, you know, take this into account. This is something that you can... Uh, pull back up and be like, hey, man, okay, my linemen, they need high levels of force. They need to work on their 10 times. Let's squat them super heavy. Okay, my skill positions. All right, well, their starts are, are good enough, right? They need to improve their high-end speed. Maybe we're looking at more of the Olympic lift derivatives uh, and even the faster movements through there, the snatches. Or maybe we're looking at resisted jumps with them. Uh, because that's going to be working more towards their phase. So what it's saying is that everything works. It's just a matter of knowing when to put what. If you're not already a student at the University of Miami, come join us at the U. We'd love to have you. Uh, the website, sites.education.miami.edu, will bring up information about how to join the program. So, you know, obviously, we have an undergraduate exercise physiology program, which this study came from. Uh, we have a graduate in strength and conditioning uh, program where you work with myself, uh, Dr. Brian Bijoli, Dr. Wes Smith, Dr. Kevin Jacobs, uh, possibly Joe, Dr. Joe Signorelli, uh, doc, possibly Dr. Motaz el Tuki, to help you in your development to, as a strength and conditioning coach uh, in, in our master's program that has got a tremendous amount of hands-on uh, activity so that you're learning here, not just with leaving here, we're not just the theory, but uh, how to actually apply that. We also have coaches education courses uh, that will be up. I'm getting you know, frustrated saying this, it'll be up any day now. I thought it would be up uh, three weeks ago, but you know, that such is life, say la vie, right? Uh, but that's what we're looking at here. Guys, if you have uh, got anything, come see us, man. Uh, love to help you out. Uh, if you've got additional questions, my email, super simple, b-m-a-n-n at miami.edu. Or you can hit me up on social media at jbrianman, uh, J-B-R-Y-A-N-M-A-N-N, -N, uh, Twitter, Instagram, etc. And it's all the same because I'm not that creative. All right, guys. I hope it was helpful, and I'll catch you later.